Do you, I wonder, believe in karma? Joseph's brothers certainly do. Years before, they've left their brother beaten, bloodied, in a hole, supposedly to die. And now they find themselves in a land of famine, being accused of being spies of the enemy and facing imprisonment, and as the small ads say, and maybe more. They say, we are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and would ye not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. We did something terrible in the past, and we are now getting our comeuppance. Didn't I tell you that this is what would happen? When something bad happens to us, do we think, what did I do to deserve this? Well, if you do, you are in the company of Joseph's brothers and indeed the majority of humanity. They, like we, are searching for a reason, a grand narrative behind what is happening. And I suspect that some of us have found ourselves asking similar questions. The most common is, why me? Why is this happening to me? And I often, in my pastoral role, hear people asking this question and grasping for an answer. Sometimes the answer they come to is, I did something terrible. Normally, when I hear what it is, it's not really terrible at all. I did something terrible as a younger person, and it must be coming back to haunt me now. Or, God must be punishing me. We can find all sorts of reasons, justifications, to explain the situation that we're experiencing. In fact, we are so obsessed with a neat explanation that we'll go to extreme lengths to provide one for ourselves, even when it doesn't make any sense. And sometimes the rationales that we can come up with can be very damaging. And so it's important for us to think about these things, and it's particularly important whilst we're not in the middle of a crisis. When something terrible is happening to us, it's much harder for us to think about it clearly. I'm going to pick uh, one example to hopefully help draw out some of this. It's not a present reality that I know or that anyone is talking to me about at the moment, but for some of you, it might be something that you're facing or something that a loved one of yours is facing in life right now. And it can be harder to hear these things in the midst of stressful times in our lives. And that's why it's important to be able to think about them when we can think clearly. Imagine this situation. A person contracts lung cancer. They've been a smoker their whole lives. We rationalise that they have cancer because of their behaviour. We can fall into karmic thinking. They've done a bad thing, and so something bad is happening to them. But really, all that we know is that smoking increases the chances of developing lung cancer. Perhaps they developed it anyway, perhaps not. Perhaps they've developed it years earlier than they would have done. Perhaps not. A second person contracts lung cancer. They've never smoked nor drunk. They've kept away from pollution. They've eaten all of their antioxidants. We can fall into karmic thinking. A bad thing has happened to them, so they must have done a bad thing. They don't engage in any behaviour that increases the risk, so there must be some other explanation. We're desperate for there to be something that we can grasp and understand, so we start making up far-fetched explanations. We can't handle the truth that there is a risk no matter the steps we take of contracting illness. It goes against our sense of fairness, our desire to be masters over our own lives. We feel like everyone should get what they deserve. 
And when the equation appears to be broken, we get really uncomfortable. And so we ask, why me? And we come up with magical answers, just like Joseph's brothers. Why are we experiencing this famine? Why are we being accused of being spies? Why are we facing imprisonment? Ah, it must be because of how we treated our brother all those years ago. We don't do this in other areas in our lives. Imagine for a minute, if you will, a pool table, red and yellow balls, one black ball in the middle, and the cue ball that you strike at them to break. The balls go all over the table, and a red ball drops into the pocket. And if I asked you why the red ball ended up in the pocket, then you'd probably say to me, well, the series of collisions that started when I hit the cue ball with my cue, and the balls cascaded all over the table, it meant that eventually one of the red balls ended up in the pocket. And if I said, yeah, yeah, no, I understand all of that, but what I'm asking you is, why the red ball and not the yellow ball? You'd say, well, that doesn't really make sense. It was, the, it was the red ball that happened to be in the right place that when they all hit each other, the red ball ended up in the pocket. And I say, but yeah, 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 yeah. But why the red ball and not the yellow ball? That's the same question that we ask when we say, why me and not somebody else? The truth is that we live in a fallen and a broken world and that at the moment, bad things just are part of our lives. And for some of us, many more, and for some of us, many fewer. Unless you think that some are saved from this, that they live charmed lives, then you need only be reminded that no matter how many swings swing in your favour, no matter how much kale you manage to eat in your lifetime, you are still not making it past 120. But when disaster occurs, why me? can often seem like a completely reasonable question. And we can convince ourselves with a completely irrational answer. It must be balancing something out from my past. In this way, karma satisfies our sense of justice about the world. And that sense is so strong. The sense that everything must happen for a reason above and beyond it simply being the ways that the balls were hit. It's so strong that we engage in all kinds of mental gymnastics just to feel like it all makes sense. We convince ourselves that karma will assert itself, good deeds are rewarded, evil deeds are punished. But it's not true and the danger is twofold. One, it leads us to false beliefs about ourselves and about God. And secondly, we end up with a worldview that is incompatible with the Christian doctrine of grace. False beliefs about ourselves and about God. We think, I did something terrible as a young person. I'm getting my comeuppance. We end up obsessing over our guilt, burdening ourselves. When what we are called to be is those who are living in the freedom that forgiveness grants us. Or we think, ah, oh, God must be punishing me. As if God were a vindictive and petty deity who kept a running tab of our misdeeds and once they hit a certain level, then pays us back with mishap and calamity. And these ideas lead us to a situation where we're believing in something that is incompatible with God's grace. If you think about the end of the story that we hear of Joseph and his brothers. So he sends all of them apart from one back. Simeon gets bound up in chains. The rest go back to go and fetch Benjamin to prove their story true. And Joseph commands their sacks filled with corn and the restoration of all of their money to every man and provision for their way. They deserve one thing and they get quite the opposite. This is what grace is about and it is incompatible with karma. And Jesus goes to great lengths in his ministry again and again to debunk this notion. He says to his disciples, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's obviously true. Jesus tells the story about the workers hired at different hours during the day. 
You know, one works for eight hours right through the hardest uh, labour of the sun, one gets picked up in the middle of the morning, one at noon time, one in the afternoon, and then some workers get picked up just one hour before the end of the day. And they are all paid the same. And for many of us, it's a really hard parable because it assaults our sense of karmic fairness. But God is a God of grace, not a God of karma, and he repays to the full all of them. Or think of uh, that most famous parable, the prodigal son. Here's this kid who insults his father, takes his money, squanders it on dissolute living, comes crawling home. From a karmic point of view, he deserves to be punished, to be rejected. And yet the father lavishes him with grace. And the older brother in the story, of course, is a kind of religion karma type of person. Here's your son of yours, he's run off with money, squandered it, I've been back at home dutifully following your will, what do I get in return? And I bet a lot of us find ourselves sympathising with that older brother. But a religion of grace says that God does not operate in that way. Every single time one returns, they get the full measure. And we should be so thankful for that because we don't get what we deserve. My goodness, thank God we don't get what we deserve, as we would under a karmic model, but we get the best that God desires for us. We're forgiven. We are welcomed into God's family. We are gifted the Holy Spirit. We are called to everlasting life in God's kingdom, where a place is prepared just for you. Forget karma. Grace is where it's at. Amen.